Earth economics, the forums like FATF, IPG, and IMF are being used. Uh, we have off and on read in the newspaper what it is all about, what it is likely to do. They have been visiting Pakistan. We have had updates, we have had apprehensions being expressed as to what can go wrong. Uh, so we have two speakers today who will clear the ambiguities and treat the subject in greater detail so that we are aware as to uh, what is uh, what FATF means for us, what it is likely to do in terms of damage, and what are the possible courses of action available to us to ameliorate and deal with this situation. So without further ado, I will invite Dr. Osman Johan to please uh, give his talk. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I'm making this presentation to you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <clears throat> at a particularly interesting time. Uh, a few hours ago, Asad Umar has stepped down as finance minister, and he won't be taking any, any other portfolio. Now, when we talk about what has happened since Pulwama, we need to consider that the war and the violence against us is not just in the conventional or even the theoretically nuclear domain. Violence is prosecuted against a people in all fields, including economics. And one important forum or medium by which this violence is being propagated against Pakistan is the Financial Action Task Force, FATF. To understand this, my objective today is to give you an idea of just what this organization, this task force, really is. Why is it dangerous for us that India might subvert, assume co-chairmanship of the APG, the mirror body of the FATF, and then lay out some of the risk factors? But those risk factors are not to create a doomsday scenario. We have been on the blacklist of the FATF before. We are on the gray list now. We are a resilient people. But it is important to know what sorts of risks permeate and how, as an economist, I think about it in an overarching fashion. So please bear with me. First, the Financial Action Task Force was created in 1989 around the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And the fear was that because the Soviet Union held the assets in trust for the people in a communist system, as private ownership would take over, it would be very haphazard. And so a lot of dark money, black money, assets that were undeclared would flow into Western Europe. And so it had to be managed in some fashion. So the G7 came up with the Financial Action Task Force to invigilate over that process, to look over the former Warsaw Pact countries and see how the assets were being legitimized, put in from the black domain of black money to the white domain. And so its first decade or so was that sort of task forcing stuff. It was an interministerial body. It still is an interministerial body. It doesn't enjoy the legitimacy of the United Nations or anything like that, but it's a voluntary organization. After 9-11, its mandate expanded. It became reoriented towards terrorist financing and anti-money laundering practices. So from Eastern Europe, it was diverted towards the Islamic world specifically. Uh, we shouldn't mince words about that. And its mandate expanded from 30 standards of what a good financial system would be in terms of financial stability, that's their uh, language, their lexicon, and financial integrity. So it's as it reoriented after to Middle East and South Asia particularly, uh, it uh, <coughs> expanded from 30 to 40, then today 40 plus 9 standards. And these standards are normative guidelines for any voluntary membership of any country to follow, to show that it follows financial practices at their best. It is a financial organization, but it is actually much more of a political organization. There is a political undercurrent that permeates the workings of it. I've already said that its legitimacy is not what the press often portrays it as, these financial experts coming and telling countries what to do. 
It is a voluntary engagement. Pakistan is one of 36 plus countries in it, and it has, by joining the FATF, signaled that it wants to adhere to strong financial practice, robust oversight of its economy. But the accountability of this institution itself, or this task force itself, is very interesting because once a verdict is delivered against a country, the mechanisms for recourse that you would have, the appellate and the appeal process behind it, doesn't exist. So, so the irony I'm presenting to you is that while it asks for financial transparency, it itself is quite opaque. It has plenaries and normative standards are given and then discussions are made, generally to attack certain groups of countries. So it's ironic that it is asking for transparency and oversight, but it isn't transparent in its own workings. And, and in speaking to that, it is ad hoc in how standards come. It went from 30 to 40 to 40 plus 9, the list can keep going. So you may be compliant with FATF as a country when you join, but you never know when the standard will put you in the wrong, on the wrong side of the FATF. Um, when we talk about who listens to the FATF, we should keep in mind that because it is, it's headquartered in Paris, and it's very close to the OECD headquarters, so OECD countries, you would think, are far more conscious about this sort of financial oversight practice, but the US Treasury Department has said very recently, less than a year ago, that when FATF or FATF mirror bodies put standards, the US doesn't need to follow them. This happened because the EU portion, the mirror body to it, uh, for the FATF had put American Samoa and other American jurisdictions under its watch list. So the Treasury Department says, we don't care, this is not necessary. So the acceptance of these financial practices, because they are normative, are not binding. We must be aware of that when we engage with the FATF. Now, the, the elephant in the room is India, and the risk is that they are vying for co-chairmanship of the Asia-Pacific Group, which is a mirror body for the FATF for this region. This is the same as the fox looking over the hen house, that this country is going to look over how financial systems are working in Pakistan. We know very much the, the love and the compassion that the Indian government has for Pakistan. So how will this play out in financial oversight? I will uh, discuss this a little bit more in, in, in detail in, on this. Uh, there's three parts to my argument about why India should be called out for not being, and, and our politicians, have, our leadership has said this, that you can pick any other country to be co-chair of the Asia-Pacific group. There is one permanent country that chairs it, and then there's another one, which could be India. Pick any other country except India. The first argument is the conflict of interest. When an enemy country is looking over your financial practices and determining that you cannot access world markets or you cannot engage, that is a very high risk thing. That's hybrid warfare uh, in, a, in a pure form. But the, the other points I want to bring are that the Indian black money is so horrific, it actually doesn't offer any legitimacy for them to do this. In Pakistan, it's estimated that the black money size is about 22% of our GDP in size. In India, it's 17%. And that is, if you look at the size, if you estimate the size of their economy, that's about $500 billion of black money in India. That is larger than the entire economy of the UAE, of Malaysia, of Denmark. That is how much black money flows through there. We, in, when we bring this complaint as uh, the standing committee, the Senate Standing Committee on the Interior, Senator Rahman Malik wrote a letter to the head of the FATF, Marshall Billingsy, and he said, okay, so the US has brought a complaint against Pakistan to the FATF, now I am bringing a complaint to you against India. India does this, this, this forms of terrorist financing, and here is the proof. So Marshall Billingsy said, well, look, we are just a prosecutorial body. We're not a prosecutorial body. We're just an oversight kind of guidelines. We're very innocent. We don't do this stuff. So Rahman Malik, Senator Rahman Malik responded, said, then why do you pursue this kind of act, action against us? If I bring a complaint to you, then why don't you pursue it if the US brought it against us? So there's a lot of double standards in this organization that I want to highlight. Um, 
Uh, and the final thing is that if India is supposed to be co-chairman, then they should bring solutions to the table. One solution that uh, the Modi government brought in 2016 was called demonetization, where the lower denominations of bank accounts would be removed from the money supply. This was such a big disaster because it actually it did the opposite of what it was intended to do vis-a-vis -vis black money. According to the estimates of the Reserve Bank of India and a few others, the number of the amount of counterfeit cash, the black money in Indian society, grew by 500 percent after demonetization. Because in the lower rungs of society, people still have to do that semi barter, cash transactions. They are not going to go to digital payments. So the counterfeit currency grew by 500 percent in that time. Demonetization has led to a loss of between 1.5 million and 5 million jobs since 2016. So not only is India not very good at dealing with the problem, it also brings the wrong solutions. This is part of the comprehensive argument I want to present why India should not be co-chairman of the APG. Uh, I seem to be going back and forward. Then there's issues about the logic of the FATF in the 21st century. So we have been hearing, do more, do more. The General Saab brought, uh, brought it up in a different context, saying that we all must do more for the country. But we've been hearing about the United States asking us to do more. The FATF is very much this logic, but translated into the economic domain, where we must do more. And then we must do more and more, and it never ends. The economic news gets tightens around you, but you are never doing enough because their standards are normative and they can change at any time. So it's a do more, do more thing with no end. Um, if the FATF were truly successful you, at what it does in terms of black money, you would have seen a decline in the amount of dark money in the world. But in absolute terms and relative to the total global money supply, black money has exploded. Why has it exploded? Because the actual centers of dark money capital flows in the world are not Islamabad and Lahore and Pathan Kot and whatever. It is at the heart of Western capitalism, London, New York, Berlin. I will give you an example from Berlin that is less than 24 hours old. Deutsche Bank, the most, the largest German bank, so the largest bank in the largest economy in Europe, has just provided evidence through internal oversight. It has admitted to 175 million euros of money laundering through its accounts. It's called the Russian laundromat operation in their internal filings. It was not brought by the FATF. It was brought by civil society, by journalist organizations. They have brought this, and then the uh, report of Deutsche Bank was brought out. They admitted to it. 175 million euros is 20, at 159 rupees to a dollar, that is 28 billion rupees. So that amount of money laundering is happen in, happening in the largest bank in the largest economy in the EU. So FATF has not been focusing on where dark money really is in the world. Instead, it has been weaponized to bully certain countries to perform to certain standards which are unattainable at the short intervals it asks us to do them. We are meeting with the FATF every three months, every two months. A society's financial architecture cannot be changed in such intervals. We have gone through this. If now we have been on the blacklist before, we are on the gray list now. The question is, how does it impact us? Why should we be worried about it? So I frame the problem in terms of risk factors. These are not absolutes. They may happen, they may not happen, but it's important to understand the impacts that you will do. If financial regulation is tightened because we are blacklisted, it can permeate into ordinary public life. Ordinary citizens can be impacted. The poor in this country are impacted in some ways and the rich in others. The first thing is that as money laundering regulations tighten, remittances will become harder to send from abroad. And this is a lifeline for our economy. We get more than a billion dollars in remittances per month. As it becomes tougher to send the money back, you, people might re revert to the Havala system. They might keep their, park their funds abroad. 
but the connection between our diaspora that is productive abroad and the people here can be disrupted, if not severed. The International Monetary Fund has been in a dialogue with Pakistan about an interim bailout of six to eight billion dollars. There's a lot of political shadow boxing that has happened, and the IMF, under pressure from a gentlemen such as Treasury Secretary Mnuchin and um, Secretary of State Pompeo, has tried to put some conditionalities on what the bailout would involve for Pakistan. Uh, one was to reveal the size, the scope, and the direction of the borrowings from China, which is politically sensitive. Pakistan is not going to budge on that. Another one might be to comply with FATF regulations. If you're on the blacklist, they don't bail you out. Um, uh, the IMF is an observer of the FATF. They are using that as the pretext for involving that criteria. Um, once you have restrictions on money flowing into the country, you may see a drop in your foreign direct investment because the costs of compliance will be difficult for foreign multinationals when they have to choose between many emerging markets. They will see that this one, Pakistan, is more difficult to get money into. Why bother? The same applies in reverse as our companies wish to internationalize, particularly the large family enterprises and so forth. They will face more hurdles, more reluctance from their counterparties to uh, engage uh, in, in commerce. So the growth is impacted. The growth of our financial sector is also impacted by this because the cost of compliance for our banks would go up under blacklisting. This means that we already have a small banking uh, sector in terms of uh, assets in, in valued in dollars compared to other Asian countries. Not only is it small, but its compliance is higher in relative terms, so it is a supreme disadvantage to our banking sector if we are blacklisted. Um, there's a more personal aspect to this too. If blacklisting is pushed forward, there are degrees of it, but if it, is, it goes to its full extent, even your credit cards that are underwritten by Visa or MasterCard will not apply overseas. You wouldn't be able to use your credit cards abroad. So things like us as individuals traveling or engaging in, in activities of an economic nature abroad would be stifled. So oh, there's one final thing about affecting the poor that is important. Uh, our society is charitable. It works a lot on philanthropy. Now, the organizations that are of political sensitivity, such as Jash and Muhammad, they may have a militant aspect, but they also have a philanthropic aspect. That philanthropic aspect is also being targeted by blacklisting, which means that, in general, organizations that are philanthropic in this country, which deal with the poor, will face difficulty in raising funds, registering themselves, and dispersing the cash outwards. So philanthropy, which is, uh, which is focalized on the poor, cannot function in the same way when you are blacklisted. Overall, this means that if, if, if there's anything, one thing we can be sure of that will happen is that inflationary pressures will go up. Inflation is going up. Our currency has been devalued. The price of petrol has been raised. So the cost of living is likely to go up. That's an immediate thing you would see from black listing. Inflation has a parasitic effect on society. So this parasitic effect would likely grow due to black listing. I'm not saying that these will happen, but these are the things that might happen as part of blacklisting. How these actually play out can be modeled. I have been working on that, but there's no conclusive um, aspect to that. Now, the government estimate is that even at gray listing, there are about $10 million of loss to the country expected annually. That's just gray listing. Blacklisting must be a larger number, however you model it. Now, there's something about the philosophy of how the FATF, this is the, the last part that I want to bring up, that is very problematic in the 21st century. The idea that economic sanctions even work, it, it, it has been proven through an academic literature to be wrong. You can see evidence of this in Venezuela, where people are living at the very edge, at the margin, at the very edge of life. But Maduro is still in power. Saddam was in power for 20 years while there was sanctions. The same applies to the revolutionary government in Iran, the same to North Korea. Economic sanctions do not change regimes or even coerce them significantly, certainly don't get rid of them, but they brutalize the people. That's the problem. 
this is a kind of collective punishment where all the people in this room will pay a price because a rounding error worth of people, whoever these so-called terrorists or whomever are, we all have to pay the price as an economy because of this small fraction of people. Collective punishment is something that the United, the United Nations rejects. We are not all culpable, but economic sanctions permeate an entirety of society. This is the illogic of this whole fashion of punishing a people, which I reject. Um, and the final thing, it's in light of what Sir Javed said as well, that Pakistan is not the perpetrator as much as it is the victim in all of this. So not only are we going to be brutalized at various levels to various degrees, but we are also the victim of terrorism itself. And so to punish a people when they are the victims is also part of the logic I want to highlight. There are many technical aspects to the FATF and how it works, but that we can consider in the Q&A. The purpose here is to discuss the philosophy of this situated as an instrument of economic violence and look at it in the context of hybrid warfare. So we must at least be alert to this. With that in mind, my last few points are about how to deal with this now. The first is that the whole fact that we are open to this type of economic violence is because we do have a large informal economy. You have seen the, the attitude that the public has towards paying taxes. It is a tiny fraction that pays taxes. You see that people are not interested in giving receipts or formalizing their transactions. So we have opened this front. We really do need to formalize our economy. Following the FATF's recommendations, in fact, isn't even enough because our own laws, our ordinance from 20, 2007, from 2010, from 2015, with uh, anti-money laundering ordinances and acts, we have everything that is, in fact, tougher than what the FATF asks us to do. But these laws have remained on the books. We have been reactive. Whenever, I'll use the um, Urdu expression, dhindora peetta hai, India or the United States, then we react and take a few measures and then leave things as they are. But a systematic effort to formalize our economy will give us better oversight of our own people. How much money is there? What is being done in this country? This is our fault. Our public is like this. It's lackadaisical attitude towards financial transparency and formalization is what has put us here. So public awareness that we are collectively responsible for this is important. We um, need to signal our commitment. This is to play, we want to play by the rules. It's in our interest in the long run to have a strong formal economy. And we must point out what India is doing. This has been discussed in the previous panel. We can consider it again, how we can bring our narrative out. And uh, not just out in the public, the contest is also directly with the FATF. This involves our negotiation. So the negotiator for Pakistan must be one who is specialized in this field. We really, this is a very complex domain, even for economists to understand how the interplay happens. So tough negotiation t from our side is the only way to deal with tough negotiation for, from their side. I hope this gives you an idea of what is happening with the FATF and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.